Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Taking charge of your future starts with taking the first steps. And saving up to $30 a month on Cox Internet with the Affordable Connectivity Program makes those steps easy to take. Whether they bring you to click upload on your first short film. Or join now for an online book club. Applying is easy. See if you qualify at cox.com slash ACP. Non-transferable one per household application and eligibility decisions are made by the FCC. You're listening to 100 Words or Less with Ray Harkins. Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another episode of 100 Words or Less. When I say yet another one, it makes it just sound like, oh, whatever, here's another episode. That's not how I feel about it. I'm very excited to bring you this conversation with Steve Larson from the classic, legendary hardcore band, Instead. He also played in Amendment 18. If I'm not mistaken, he played in Alligators. I could be completely wrong about that one, but we talk all about Instead, because they are such an interesting band to me. Not only are they, you know, definitely revered within the, uh, you know, classic slash old school hardcore scene, but, uh, you know, did you know they put out a record on Epitaph? Yeah, they did. And they were a band that um, just predated so much of the stuff that obviously happened in the 90s, you know, the resurgence of all the old school hardcore that happened in the early 2000s. And um, yeah, yeah more on that in a moment, but I have to thank you because I have been seeing a lot of downloads recently for all of the episodes I've been putting out, you know, doing bonus stuff. And I just appreciate you sharing and spreading the word where you can genuinely, genuinely do appreciate that. You can always email the show at 100 words podcast at gmail.com. Love to hear feedback and just maybe saying what's up, whatever. I also get a lot of DMs as well. So, you know, you can feel free to follow along on the social media platform, Instagram. I think, uh, I think many of you are probably familiar with. <laughs> Anyways, that's a hundred words podcast, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, yeah, you can do that. You can also for absolutely free takes you maybe 30 seconds out of your day. Go to Apple podcasts, subscribe rate and review. Those are all things that you can do because you subscribe, it costs you zero dollars. This podcast will come up ever, whenever we release a new episode. And then, um, yeah, if you leave a rating and review, it helps people find it on that particular platform. If you leave a rating on Spotify, it does the same exact thing. 30 seconds. That's all it takes. And it helps out the show in tremendous ways. The algorithm, you know, the almighty algorithm that so many of us are, are fighting to get our stuff seen. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm no better than that. So anyways, that's, those are all the things you can do to support the show. And it does, it makes a difference for one. Actually, I'm, I'm like doing all these lists. <laughs> I need to tell you, I'm very excited because I'm working on a book. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, you know, formally announce, announce it much later, but, um, yeah, there's, there's some stuff happening there. I'm just excited because I got, you know, so I'm working with a cool editor and it's, man, I'm excited. So just wanted to uh, sneak peek that to you out there. And also I spent the weekend, just a, uh, you know, little music update as it were. First of all, this is a, you know, very sort of not self-congratulatory, but it's like I, I manage a band. That band's name is Roman Candle. I flew out to the East Coast. They are a part of the Dying Wish headlining tour that's happening right now. I flew out to watch them in Philly and Brooklyn, and both shows were incredible. Was able to meet up with friends of the show and just just have a great time. But watching a band just like really grab people, make them pay attention. And that's what Roman Candle is doing. And it's just, I don't know, man, it gave me that, 
really warm feeling in the soul. Like I'm like literally touching my heart right now. (laughs) Like not obviously physically like in my body, but you know, just like rubbing my chest, I'll say. But that feeling you get when you watch a band and like they're just firing in all cylinders and they're just doing the thing that they want to be doing. It's, oh man, it's so gratifying. Even if I was not, (laughs) you know, business wise attached to the band, I would be getting that feeling as well. It was their first U.S. tour. It's just so exciting, and I love to see the enthusiasm for the band. And uh, yeah, just the core continues to fill me up. So good, so good. So, anyways, let's uh, let's talk to Steve Larson, the drummer of Instead, because yeah, they. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it. They were definitely one of the first merch bands. I would say where it's like their merch was like so incredibly pervasive, especially here in Southern California. Um, granted, I never got to see Instead in their original incarnation. Saw a few reunions when they did them in the uh, 2000s and 2010s. But um, I just, I found the band to be like their their imaging was arresting. And I know <laughs> that they sold a boatload of merch when they were around. And they were drawing so many people not only here in Southern California, but across the country to where, you know, Epitaph picked them up. And that was a, like, still to this day, I don't think that Epitaph has ever released like a traditional old school hardcore band. Like, I'm just thinking off the top of my head right now, and I really can't. I mean, obviously, like, I guess you could argue Converge, but sonically, no. Anyways, but uh, Instead was just a, a really interesting band, and so I had to have Steve on the show, and he was gracious enough to accept. So here we go. Here's Steve. Let's talk to him. As a person of a certain age, I'm a little little bit younger than you, so I only got to see instead when you guys did the you know a variety of reunion shows over the years. Um, oh, okay. But the yeah, but the band was always incredibly interesting to me because you know clearly you were obviously you know straight edge hardcore bands, but you know as you kind of progressed, you know putting out obviously more than one record and mm-hmm. touring a lot and everything like that you it seems like you took swings you know like signing to epitaph as an example that was you know like a little bit different than obviously most bands that you were friends with and peers with because obviously it's it seemed like a very definitive fork in the road where it's like all right you either continue to be you know a hardcore band or you obviously go the uh you know butt rock route um which many of your many of your peers did but um what, what I guess what inspired you guys to make that uh, you know decision to go over to Epitaph because that that still is a very you know interesting decision. Yeah, I, I don't know that there's been another band like us on Epitaph since. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm a little uh, you know old and out of date. But um, it was really pretty straightforward. We had opened for Bad Religion at the Country Club out in Reseda, mm-hmm. and. Um, I don't know if you ever, you know, went there, but there was like this, this merch table that was just before you walked into the main room. And it was just like a, I don't know, like a, it was probably a bar at one time is what it was like a mini little small bar where you could grab drinks at a show when they were doing country shows back there. Right. But anyways, Mm -hmm. um, so they had their stuff set up in there and we of course had 87 different varieties of t-shirts, colorways and so on and so forth. And so the first thing, and I'm speaking kind of like on behalf of Brett Gerwitz right now. So sure. the, the first thing for them is who the fuck are these guys? And all this, or money. they got so much, yeah. Where they got so much merch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and so they, they were clueless on who or what we were, you know what I mean? So as the evening progresses, we play place goes bananas and we're just selling shirts like, 10 to one to bad religion, you know? And so he took notice and he took notice of the, the, you know, the, the, um, the, the crowd, the audience, whatever you want to, 
you know, call it, but he was like, mm -hmm. all right, these guys, these guys have something going on and I need to, I need to see if I can, you know, reel them in. And so I believe the show was on a, a Saturday and Monday morning he called Kevin. Somehow he tracked down Kevin and called him uh, and just said, Hey, this is Brett Gerwitz and blah, blah, blah. And I remember Kevin calling me at home being, dude, Brett Gerwitz just called me. Like, what, <laughs> what are you talking about? You know? So it was like right. this whole, like, it, it was really organic, you know? Um, it was just was a guy running a record label and in a hugely influential ban on us and many others um you know taking notice and and basically doing the, the groundwork to to get to us because it wasn't so easy to get phone numbers back then uh it was landline to landline is what that call was you know so yep. so it really just happened like that and you know he asked if we had any uh new material recorded and we you know no we don't we just uh i think i think I'm trying to remember the chain of events. I think it was more like, Hey, can you come guys come down and meet with me? And then we went and met with them at West beach studios, which was also epitaph headquarters at that time. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just sat down with him and, you know, he talked about what he wanted to do and what he saw. He had like a business plan. It was casual, but it was like serious. Like he was looking at hardcore and punk rock in a whole different, on a whole different level than everybody else, in my opinion, at that time. And we were a hard working band, if nothing else. Um, you know, we made records, we toured, we came back, we, we rehearsed, we wrote songs, made a record, we toured, you know, and that's just what we didn't realize is innocently, we were doing what, what working bands are supposed to do, right? Like you write songs, you record them, you tour them. And we, we, we didn't care anything about the, the business aspects of it. It's just what we did. And, um, so anyways, uh, so yeah, you know, you just asked us if we had any songs recorded and we said, no, we just have like a boom box recording of a couple of things we'll work on. He's like, well, that's fine. Bring those with you. And so when we had that meeting, we had the cassette with us, threw it on, he listened to about 30 seconds of it, maybe, and goes, okay, <laughs> you know, all right, let's sure. do this. You know, like it was so like, yeah, and here's what I'm going to do. And, you know, it was, it was just it was so quick and easy and we as a band we were never really interested in in following trends which i i think seems kind of weird looking back on it because it seems like we did follow a lot of trends i i think more we were kind of caught up in the wave of straight edge because while instead was you know a straight edge band i viewed us more as like a posi band and and even more so as a punk band especially when you go back to bonds of friendship and that's a pretty diverse record as far as like the way it sounds compared to what was you know youth of the day or uniform choice or anything like that you're hearing all the english influences you're hearing you know yeah you can still hear some stolid 13 in there or whatever but there's a lot of influences on that first record more so than the seven inch and, and then probably even more so than the the epitaph record Right. No, it's really, and I, I can totally like you painting that picture. I can see that happening so clearly because it was like, to your point, that era of, you know, hardcore, like there really was no plan of attack for a hardcore band to like continue. I mean, the only band that you could really point to would be like, oh yeah, like sick of it all. Like, you know, maybe we could do something like them, but that was not again, not common. And so it's like, okay, we need to either mold our sound to morph into something that would be, you know, quote unquote, more commercial, or, you know, there's a pretty short shelf life for what it is that we're doing. But that's really cool that, you know, and Brett, actually, obviously. The, right. the, the latter of what you said there is what it was to us. We knew we had a limited shelf life. We knew we were limited in Kevin's singing ability, for example. No, no offense to Kevin. It's just he couldn't do something more than what he was already doing, you know? Right. So so we, we, we absolutely discussed that as well. Like, how much longer can we do this? You know, uh, there's very few bands like Bad Religion who kind of, you know, wash, rinse, repeat, and it's still great, right? Like, mm -hmm. their one trick is a very good trick. 
and I'm I'm oversimplifying it for the sake of this conversation, but really, they're to me uh, at a at a very high level, they're just a one trick pony. That's it's a very good trick, and they're very good at it. And and I'll keep listening to Bad Religion every time they make a new record. So, yep. Anyways, no, and that's and to your point too. I'm sure it was as simple as you know deals that were getting done on you know revelation or anything else where it's basically like brett's like oh yeah you know like i'll I'll pay you know eight grand for you to record your record and you probably were like that's the most money we've ever seen for a record ever (laughs) or it's like what do you mean you're gonna pay yes yeah (laughs) and then but i I, i'm interested in the idea of like where he felt like he wanted to you know take you because obviously he was watching hardcore kind of grow but you know do you do you remember any sort of you know vision for how he wanted to play the band out it wasn't, it wasn't even really, you know, specific to instead other than him saying, Hey, look, there's a bigger world out there for you. You guys know, mm. that, right? Like if you guys are doing this well here, let's take this show to Europe. Let's go nuts. Like you guys have, you guys are barely scratching the surface of your total potential. And so, um, you know, he's like, I mean, he was talking about poster campaigns. So for example, and you may have heard this on other podcasts, right? Uh, but you know, I remember driving through Hollywood and seeing like a Janet Jackson poster campaign with instead pasted right next to her, like just as, just as much action as that, you know? So there were all these instead what we believe posters all over Hollywood and LA. And, you know, so he was doing stuff like that back then. He was, he was, he was mimicking what major labels were doing just on a a, a smaller scale. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. And just and and that idea of taking what you guys are doing and making it, you know, a, give it a little more of a cosine and obviously professional sheen to it, which is, you know, realistically like anybody that not only listens to the Epitaph record, but, you know, looks at just the graphic design and everything that you put into it. It's just like, oh, yeah, this is just like, you know, maybe a little bit of a step up from what they did previously. Correct. That's absolutely correct because we had a budget to do a record cover. So we hired uh, Gavin Oglesby to do it, you know? Yep. So, and I knew Gavin from playing in Carrie Nation with him and just from being in No, uh, no For an Answer and just being scene kids, you know? Like at one point we were all just scene kids going to shows, yep. seeing each other at Fenders. And we may not have all known each other, but we knew each other from sight, you know? But anyways... Yeah, to your point, you know, so uh, and then I got to kind of go back on your original question. So his his plan was promote the, the shit out of you and get you to Europe. And let's really see what your potential is. You know, the unfortunate thing yeah. is Desert Storm broke out when we were ready to do that European tour. And so we couldn't do it. And so uh, there was restrictions on flights and gear and all this stuff. It was different than it is today. Like today, you probably still could do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, but so what we ended up doing ended up being our last tour, uh, in the, in the late spring, early summer of 91. And, uh, and and, yeah, we just, you know, like, Hey, we've all taken time off work and school. Uh, let's just, uh, let's just, we can't go to Europe, but let's just do another U S we got to support it U S anyway. So let's do it now. And, um, yeah. I mean, that was, I mean, that's pretty much what his plan was like, put some money into you, uh, push you out to Europe and, you know, put some money into you being at, like we were in ads because, uh, against the grain and what we believe were released, I believe on the same day. And, um, so, you know, we were getting ad space with bad religion in maximum rock and roll and, uh, flip side and, and all the big zines back then, you know, like full page ads. So, right. Um, and that know, was and never, was little, yeah. yeah, that was never an option for us. <laughs> right, and, right, right, right. And there was definitely a little bit of backlash too. And we knew that would come too, you know, so it, it was fine, you know, um, just that's not really pertinent to your question, but no, but it's the that that's the yeah. environment because yeah, no many no bands, especially in the early nineties, were able to make any drastic moves without getting the, you know, sellout flack thrown directly yeah. upon them, yeah. even if it was something as simple as, you know, putting a barcode on a record. 
Yeah. And, and also, I mean, just again, this is hindsight speaking. Now we were burning so brightly at that time. Like there was no place to go, but down, man, like people just were, you know, like I would have been sick of us. You know what I mean? Like if I was on the outside looking in, like we were, you know, we were, we were being asked to be on every show that was, you know, whether it was a, an international act or a national act coming through, like sometimes they'd ask us to play over bands and, or, or support bands so that they could put them in a bigger room and pay us more than the headliner. You know, there was stuff like that going on. Uh, and, and that's not, you know, breaking my arm to pat myself on the back. That's just the way it was. And all I'm trying to do is illustrate the fact that I know that we probably um, were just, we were over, over playing, over publicized, over, um, just everybody was over it to some degree. Right. No, I, and it, no, it's true. I mean, the overplaying concept, like, you know, that really didn't come into bands consciousness until like, honestly, probably like late nineties, early two thousands where you're like, Oh, maybe if we play once every three months, it's like the show will be much better than us playing, you know, four times in two months. Like it's just right to, to your, yeah. The overexposure is real. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and so while no one was outwardly saying that to us, I think that we suffered from it a little bit, especially at the very end, we just played so much and, uh, it seemed seemingly for every national act that was coming through, like, Hey, it's a Wednesday night at the country club. Can you guys, uh, can you guys get on this bill so we can fill the room? Sure. Right. And it was, sure. and it was nice. And it was nice, you know, like promoters reaching out to us. Uh, we got along with so many, it's such a wide variety of bands. Cause I think sometimes that, that gets overlooked with us too. Like we, we were, you know, it was easy to just say, Oh, instead's a straight edge band, you know, blah, blah, blah. Youth of the day, uh, whatever uh you know that whole we get we get lumped in with the whole youth crew thing and and there's some truth to that but the 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 real truth is that we were friends with agnostic front uh we were friends with such a wide breadth of bands and and just from touring and playing on all these really diverse bills that became non-existent later on in our career um because everything it, it's kind of like one of those things, right? Careful what you wish for. Like, oh, we can have all straight edge shows now. And that's cool because all the straight edge kids can come out and you don't have to worry about like, at, l- at least in, you know, like Long Beach with the lads at, at Fenders or something like that. Like those guys aren't going to bother coming to this show. So it's a, it's a quote unquote safe environment, right? Uh, but then became like subgenres of straight edge. And, and then it just became everything that you ended up in punk rock against you know like i don't want the clicks and you got to look a certain way and dress a certain way and so on and so forth and the whole the whole i guess you'd call it movement got a little wonky and generic and you know just watered down and meaningless um Mm -hmm. and it would just became like like how straight edge are you you know like i i I, to the you know back then and to this day i don't care if somebody's straight edge i could care less you know like who cares Right. Right. It's a personal, it's a personal choice. And you guys, I mean, you guys obviously always were, even though you were proud to display that you were a straight edge, you were always, in my opinion, more aligned with a seven seconds than, you know, I mean, obviously Sonic, right. It's like, it didn't, it didn't evolve into the whole, you know, like obviously hard line and like all that sort of stuff until after you guys were broken up. But at that you're especially with your willingness to play with all of these type of bands. Like it didn't make you uh, sectioned off to where you could only play with like, okay, here we go. Like here's the 15th show with, you know, uniform choice or whatever. Correct. In fact, we didn't play with them much. You know, I I think we played with agnostic front more than we played with, with uniform choice, which is crazy, but, but yeah, we were playing with Fang. We were playing with the dwarves. We were playing with, like we, we didn't care. Like we just wanted to play and we wanted to be exposed because for us, especially, you know, I'm, I'm 54 now, but, but for me, I could go to Fenders on any weekend and just be introduced to new bands, great bands that I'd never even heard of before, you know? And, and so there was that spirit inside of all of us because we would roll in from, from Anaheim to Long Beach, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you're a teenager, it is. 
you know, it was, that was an adventure and you know, you get, you get defenders and you get to, you know, like Jane's addiction was playing on punk bills, you know, like, so you get exposed to all these weirdos and freaks in a good way, you know, and that's how I found most of the greatest music I ever found in my life. Rockabilly.com is back. I mean, they've never left. Let's be honest. They are such a supporter of the show and I want to thank them immensely. And in turn, they want to thank you as a consumer by giving you a promo code, hundred words or less. You can enter as the promo code and we'll get you 10% off your entire order. They did some amazing Halloween collaborations that if you visit the site soon enough, they probably still have some. How about Misfits, Aquabats, Gojira, Typo Negative, like just to give you a nice little sampling of what it is they got going on. But trust me in saying they have merch from bands that, you know, your mom and dad would like, maybe your brother or sister, or maybe your aunt or uncle. This is a great gift giving thing. You can knock out all your shopping in one fell swoop. They ship it from the Midwest here in the United States. It gets to you very fast and you will just look that cool by, you know, putting this under the tree and like, you know, your sister opens up her present and she's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you got me this cool band shirt that I've never seen before. Let's just make you the hero at the holidays. Wow, how about that? That's a really good tagline. <laughs> Anyways, rockabilly.com, 100 words or less is the promo code, 10% off your order and uh, yeah, benefit all of the things when you are buying from Rockabilia yourself, your family, your friends, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, rockabilly.com, 100 words or less, the promo code, go buy now. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. You know those moments in your life where you reach a fork in the road and you're being like, left, right, I don't know. Left is like, you know, palm trees. Right is like forest. They both look like good ideas, but who who do I turn to? Do I talk to friends, family? And sometimes... You need a third party to be able to help you walk through these monumental decisions in your life. And that is where therapy comes into play. I'm a huge advocate for therapy, and it is a very beneficial thing to me, and I know many of my friends. And that is why I love working with BetterHelp. If you're thinking about giving therapy a try, start here. BetterHelp is amazing because it's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and most importantly, suitable to your schedule. All you do is pop onto their website, fill out a brief questionnaire, and then you get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists if the vibe isn't right. And at no additional charge, all of this stuff is incredible. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. So visit betterhelp.com slash Ray today to get 10% off your first month. That is a great deal. And I know that I'm saying that because it's an advertisement, but straight up an awesome deal. That's betterhelp.com slash Ray and get therapy. It is a amazing thing to get for yourself. So betterhelp.com slash Ray for 10% off your first month. I have to ask just because obviously the the drum kit is always uh, something interesting like as you start to grow up and want mm -hmm. to play drums like were you, yeah. were your parents like oh my god like what what is our what is our child getting into and like we have to put up with this noise or were I mean obviously they were supportive cuz you continued to do it but what was the uh, what was the initial approach there So so uh yeah I was fortunate I grew up in an old craftsman style home in Anaheim and our garage was detached from our house and it was quite a ways from our house. And then it was off of an alley. So I wasn't really going to borrow, bother any houses near me. Basically my parents gave the garage up to me. And, um, so I would just go out there, slap on headphones and just play along to things and just teach myself and over and over and over and over. And, you know, just keep, you know, exploring music that I like, you know, even things I didn't like just to learn something, you know what I mean? But eventually I, I soundproofed it. And then, you know, then people started coming in with their guitars, wanting to play with me because people knew I played drums now. And, uh, you know, but, but go back, going back to your, you know, original question, they were very actually for my family being poor, they were very supportive and my fa my, my parents sacrificed and bought me a drum kit. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm super appreciative of that. And I got, I never got anything less than their full support to play drums, which was nice, but I think it helped having a detached garage 
you know, half an acre from your house, right. you know? <laughs> right. So. No, that's, that's it. That's incredible. And it, honestly, j- that idea too, of usually the drummer's place ends up being the congregation point for many obvious reasons. And so for you to have that space was, you know, great because then you could just entertain all of these different weirdos where it's like, all right, we'll play cover songs. We'll be, you know, yeah. a punk band here, a rock band here, and then just, you know, create. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I was trying to do. And my whole goal was to just be, be a good enough drummer to play in a band. That's all I cared about. I didn't care about being the best drummer. I didn't care about any of that. I just wanted to play in a band. Uh, you know, I'd spend time on the sidelines, you know, watching bands, appreciating bands, writing letters to bands, buying records, all the things you do when you first enter the scene. Uh, and now I wanted to play in a band and I didn't have any thoughts of like being big or anything like that. None of that existed. I just wanted to, to play in a band. Um, and so I did. Yeah, no, it's incredible. And I mean, I know your entry point just based off of uh, previous interviews that I was looking into, you know, like a, a lot of the, as far as like indie stuff is concerned, stuff that was clearly not in the radio or your parents were listening to, you know, like social distortion, obviously uniform choices we spoke about previously. And yeah. Can, can you speak to what, I guess, kind of drew you in? Was it obviously just the, you know, the fact that the the sounds hit you? Was it, you know, the energy at the shows? Like, what, what drew you in? I, I think I think it's a lot of that stuff. Um, and I think, like, most people that you talk to, like, I had a friend who was two years older than me. And um, just kind of backing into it, my, my parents were young. I, they were 20 when, when, they, when I was born. And they were big music fans and they collected records but you know they were more of like that whole you know they were the 70s uh what what we i guess our generation calls classic rock right so you know the led zeppelin the the arrows early aerosmith um uh black sabbath all, all that stuff was on heavy rotation in my house and so there was no like music was just in my life then my friend Neil uh, entered, I forget what record he played for me first, but I, I was blown away, just like, whoa. So it was English punk. I just don't remember if it was GBH, I, 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 Discharge. I don't, I don't remember. But, but I got sucked in on English punk. Uh, and then, um, then he told me about this radio show, Rodney on the Rock, um, where he played this stuff. So I started, um, recording it on, on cassette, his show, I would just sit there and record songs and take notes of who he said the band was. And then I would save my paper out money and buy records. And, and that's kind of how I, and, well, and then, you know, once you go to your first show, like it's one thing to hear the music and especially then, you know, like some of that had a lot of shock value to it, you know, like fear the record had a lot of shock value. I also would argue that it's a fucking great record, but right. there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of shock value to that. And so it's like, Ooh, you know, like listen to this, you know, uh, TSOL yep. dance with me was a big one for me. Um, social distortion, 1945, mommy's little monster. Um, but some of that stuff came on later from listening to Rodney on the rock and just getting introduced to all this. And eventually Rodney on the rock punched me in the face with minor threat. And that was the one where I was really like, Hey, what is this? This is, this, this speaks to me on a different level, even, even more so than this other stuff. And then it was like, Oh wait, then I, then, then you, you know, you find out about straight edge and stuff like that. And I, I come from a family of hard partiers and I was already drinking a lot, doing drugs. uh, And it was not frowned upon in my family because that's what everybody did. All my uncles had been through rehab, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and I, I don't mean to laugh like, haha, that's funny. It's just, that's what life was. That's what you encountered. Yeah. 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 And nobody was frowning at me drinking at 13 years old at all, you know? Sure. So what I real, what I, I think what was good for me is that, um, everyone around me was bottoming out. And so I didn't have to experience, I, I, I experienced it through them and told myself, I don't want to do this. This is not, 
the direction I want to go. And then to find out that there's this crazy sounding band that is all about not partying and not fucking yourself up and not being nihilistic, like, whoa, okay, let me, let me look into this more. And then I, I went down that rabbit hole and I never came out. And that's amazing. That, yeah. As I say that, I still love everything else that I, you know, I, I, I'll listen to fear the record sometime next week for sure. You know, um, I, I love all the, you know, like the, the, the orange County punk, the vandals, the, you know, uh, adolescents, um, all that stuff. It, it, it's all really, really important stuff to me. DI, I fucking love DI. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it all, it, yeah, it, it all started to draw you in. And I, I love that. That's what's so fun about these stories is that you're, you're drinking from a fire hose and you're just consuming it all because like, yeah, because even though you know that the bands sound different, like you're not <laughs> categorizing them by genres. It's basically just this huge umbrella of like punk and whatever that means, all yeah. this stuff gets shoved in there. It's so exciting. Yeah, I, I, especially in the beginning, I wasn't differentiating between corrosion and conformity, um, GBH, fear, uniform choice. It was all just punk to me, you know? They were definitely, you know, as you evolve in it, you start to realize, okay, there's, these are subgenres. You know, these bands go in a little box, I guess. Um, you know, if you want to get into crossover and straight edge hardcore and things like that. But to me for the you know for the most formative years of my life first getting in that was all the same to me it was all all part and parcel of my tribe yep oh absolutely and like you said once you you know started to get involved with the you know the scene and play shows and form bands like that was you know what you what you focused on was there any um, I guess for lack of a better term, life path for you, other than the fact that you just obviously wanted to play music? Like, was there any expectations from your parents to be like, oh, here, follow the family trade or, you know, become a lawyer, or doctor or whatever the, you know, typical things that get placed upon kids occasionally? Yeah, actually, um, there was not. Um, my, my, um, my family was very blue collar. And so there were no expectations of, of college or career or anything like that which probably, I mean, I think it cuts both ways. Sometimes that's a help and sometimes it's a hindrance. You know what I mean? Like um, it allowed me the ability to, to think for myself and do what I wanted to do. But I think sometimes there's something to be said for, you know, successful families who, who help their children, you know, become successful themselves um, that just wasn't an option for me. Um, and I know there's good and bad to both sides of it, but, but yeah, no, there was to answer your question directly. No, there was no expectation put on me whatsoever. Yeah. And the idea of obviously being a drummer, like, you know, the, the joke is obviously like, no one takes pictures of the drummer. No one pays attention to the drummer. <laughs> like, you know, just as a, uh, quote unquote disposable is like a bass player, obviously I'm being yeah. hyperbolic here, but um, was there, you know, I, I guess a comfort level for you, like when you started to play some of those larger shows that like, were you intimidated by that or were you able to kind of, you know, step into it and just be like, all right, just focus and obviously make sure I'm keeping the beat. Yeah. You know what? That's a, that's a really great question. Um, so I, everything happened so fast. I never really took the time to reflect and be like, the only time I ever remember being intimidated was our first Fender show. And we were opening for the bad brains and I walked in the door right when they were sound checking and I against I, the album I against I just came out. And, uh, I was like, Oh, I, I don't belong here Cause those guys were also great musicians too. So, like watching them sound check, like just standing there with my jaw on the floor, like, what am I doing? Like, I, Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. right. You know, like, so that was the only time I really ever felt that way after that. Um, overall, um, I felt like I could just hold my own 
you know, especially when it came to punk and hardcore, I, I, I knew like a lot of people were asking me to help them in bands, like either play in their bands, fill in for somebody or, or whatever. So I think, you know, like I was getting messaging like, Hey, you're, you're a good drummer. People want you to play in their bands, help them out, whatever. Um, that looks like it, you know, whatever questions come your, Hey, can you help us? You know, we're in the studio. We don't have a drummer you know, like, Hey, would you, would you consider playing with us? All that stuff. So I, I always felt comfortable and confident until we opened for our scream open for us, um, at the country club. And this, there was this, they had this new drummer, this guy, uh, his name was Dave Grohl. I don't know if you've heard of him. And, uh, yep. <laughs> he's like, Hey man, I broke my bass drum pedal. Uh, you think I can use yours? And I was just like, Oh fuck, man. I hate what in my gear. Yeah, this this boner's you know, gonna break it. Yeah, totally. right. <laughs> he was like this greasy, long-haired kid, and he had like army pants cut off and thermals underneath them, and he looked every bit the part of a hardcore kid, you know. Uh, yeah. And, and and so I'm like, all right. So I'm like, I'm just gonna stand, you know, side stage here and watch this guy, make sure he doesn't screw up my shit. And you know, for as confident as I was feeling, that rug got pulled right out from underneath me that evening. Like, oh okay (laughs) Uh, yeah oh so you're so so you're like really good and stuff okay cool that's what a good drummer looks like got it (laughs) noted (laughs) yeah well and it's funny it's funny too because you i mean like every child and teenager has an ego about themselves like once they get any sort of recognition and notoriety whatever that may mean i don't care if it's sports or whatever and so anytime you are able to eat a piece of humble pie and be like, Oh, so other people like, okay, got it. Like that's yeah. good for you to swallow that, you know? hundred percent, hundred percent. I had no idea what he was going to go on to become, but Hey, there it was right there. I should have known. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and by the way, total sweetheart of a dude. He was so nice and so humble. Uh, but yeah, it was like, uh, Right. Oh, I I don't, yeah, I don't care. Totally. I don't care who you are. It's like, you know, when, I mean, drummers, as you can understand, are a very particular type of person from the symbols they use to the way that the toms are set up. And so it's like the moment that anyone messes with your stuff, it's kind of like, oh, damn it. Like this is, it's going to break. It's going to break. Like this is reality. (laughs) 100%. And for me at that time, I had, I had epitaph money. I was, I had nice gear and I did not want anybody messing it up. So, you know, as, yeah, yeah. As lame as that sounds, that was the truth of the matter. Like I knew I had nice stuff. Don't mess it up. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. And when you, um, you know, when you started to go out and tour, like you definitely, you guys were not messing around in regards to the, the pace at which you were touring, which obviously, you know, as you've said in this discussion and other places like that obviously led to the end of the band because you were, you know, just playing so many shows. Um, Was it, um, I mean, touring, I'm sure for maybe the beginning was, you know, exciting. Like how did your evolution of touring go in your own head? Like, did you enjoy it pretty much the entire time or was there, you know, some, some bottoms you fell into? Well, you know, I mean, Ray, have you toured before? Yes, I have. I've, uh, I, I know, I know what it's like playing in front of, you know, four people in Omaha, Nebraska or whatever. So yes. Right. Right. And, and just being in a van with the guys, you know, so you're always going to have moments, right? There's just, that's, that's a tight space for five or six guys. And, you know, again, it's, it's a, it's a uh, wash, rinse, repeat thing too, you know, like new city, same thing, new city, same thing, new city, same thing for the most part. Right. Um, But overall, I just took it all in stride. I felt like I felt like I was on vacation. Um, I felt like I was, um, you know, participating in something I had long admired, you know, um, from afar, you know, and um, and I took it seriously. I, I, I was I tried to be very kind to people when we were in their town or in their scene or staying in their home. Um, people that made food for us and whatnot. Um, but I, I really, really enjoyed touring. Uh, I wish I was still doing it, to be honest with you. 
Sure, sure. Well, and that's and and when you start to ha- have those, you know, business implications and all these other things that you know sometimes complicate what it is that uh, a band is trying to do. You know, not everybody carries those burdens, or not everybody, um, you know, really is like, well, that's that's not the point, like, of why we're doing this. Like, yo, know, like, can we just keep touring? <laughs> you know, it's like, can we right. can we just keep moving along? But then, you know, it's those external circumstances that sometimes, you know, really throw the wrench in the in the system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and you know, we were often told how we couldn't do things, uh, and I remember specifically, we we flew to the East Coast. Um, and, and did, I believe 10 shows over spring break. And everybody's like, you guys can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. And we're like, sure we can watch us. And so we printed a bunch of shirts, of course, and we hooked up, uh, somebody hooked us up with vision. Um, and we used their gear. They picked us up at the airport and we just, we, we did the whole East coast and there was, everybody was on spring break. So there was a group of like at different times, you know, 10 to 20 people following us from show to show to show. And, and guess what? We made money. So right, like, everybody's like, you can't possibly fly and do all this and blah, blah. Yes, we can. And we did. Evilgreed.net is the website that you need to pull up on your browser of choice because they're an amazing web store solution for bands and record labels, touring primarily in Europe, but, uh, you know, they ship worldwide. And what you as the consumer can benefit from is you can buy all that stuff from their website. They make it super, super easy for you to shop all of these different stores. But the thing I like about Evil Greed is the fact they act like a record label. But before I dive into it, let's give you a promo code. How about 10% off your order by using the code 100 words? And when you go to the website, you immediately look at me like oh wow like they got they got speed shirts or how about blood incantation or chelsea wolf how about that or how about brutus one of my favorite records from last year anyways they have a very specific point of view and the fact that they work with bands that are artistically heavy that's what i like to call it but evil greed they're based in berlin germany but they ship worldwide and let me tell you the shipping rates here to the united states pretty cheap And it gets to you in around a week. I've ordered from them in California before and I have got it in around a week. Like we'll call it 10 days maybe. But I love this company so much. And like I said, they have a very specific point of view. Like you can't buy everything on here, but you can buy the stuff that you most likely listening to this show would enjoy. So go to evilgreed.net, use the promo code 100 words. That way it tells you or them that you heard about it on the show and the whole marketing loop just just continues to work. So evilgreed.net, 10% off your order. 100 words is the promo code. Go there now. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. ChumbaCasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Speaking of the merch, like you were joking about at the very beginning, like, I mean, you guys were definitely a, you know, merch band before people even knew really what that meant. Like, right. you know, where it, it, that it gave your band a, you know, sheen of profession professionality even though it's not even a word um right. it, and like how did you guys i guess hit on that was it just something that you kind of started to trip into and you're like well of course we're going to print more shirts because we sold out the last you know two shows or whatever um or was that kind of like a a really you know important piece of the band as far as the you know visuals were concerned well um so I would say by and large, we learned from the masters and the masters to us were uniform choice and or wishing well. Um, so I remember distinctly one year, I, I think it was my sophomore year of high school. I was going to see uniform choice and white flag. And I forget who else out in Riverside, I think it was. And I told my mom, you know, Hey, can, can, instead of like going to get, 
back to school clothes. Can you give me money? And I'm going to buy a bunch of band shirts because I knew the, you know, uniform choice and the owners of wishing well, were going to have all of their shirts. They were going to have youth of today. They were going to have blast. They were going to have unity. And guess what? I bought every one of those shirts. My mom gave me the money and I, I did back to school shopping at a show. That's true. <laughs> but anyways, um, that's kind of where it, like I was just following their lead. Like it made sense to me. Like, and I was a kid who liked shirts and I would, I had been stenciling my own shirts for bands that I liked that didn't have shirts. So I was like, Hey, um, it kind of goes back to what, you know, what we were talking about touring. I wanted to make sure that I was kind and, and nice to, and respectful to people. Um, because they're paying money to see my band, you know what I mean? And conversely, I also wanted to make sure that if somebody wanted a shirt, we had a shirt, you know, in, in our case, a shirt or 10. So, you know, cause they might need a long sleeve. They might need a hoodie. They might need sweatshorts. I don't know. I got to make sure I'm covered. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that we were just following that lead and it was to your point, it was guerrilla marketing before there was guerrilla marketing, you know, uh, or the term existed. And, and I was, largely tasked with the visuals of instead i'd say probably 90 percent of what anything that's instead was has my hands on it as far as the, the aesthetic right right and that and i mean i think that's really why the you know aesthetics especially of that era of hardcore are so long lasting because it has that it has that weird combination of like timeless yet of such a specific era where it's like, yeah, you know, the, it just cuts through. Like, you know, anytime you see the, you know, you see on shirts, it's people like don't even have any connection to like punk or hardcore. Or like, Oh, that's a great image. <laughs> and it's like, same thing can be said about the instead stuff as well. Yeah. You, you see straight and alert, straight and alert, straight and alert, straight and alert, straight and alert. Like it's great. You know, even you right. see your head is great, you know, and, and they're very similar, but they're quite different at the same time. And so like, for me personally, um, I've always liked t typography. Like I, I, it, it interests me like as much as a painting does, or maybe even more so than a painting in a lot of cases, I'm really interested in the way letters look and how they fit together, especially if they're different font families and things like that. Um, and then, you know, as you know, back then it was a lot of work to try and do that stuff because you couldn't just sit on Photoshop and, blast these things out you had to really work and do rub off letters and you know cut and paste things and i was running clear transparencies through xerox machines and using a razor blade to scrape things off and make them look the way i wanted them to look um i think i'm did i get off the beaten path on this question i feel like i did no 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 i told but no you, you're just that idea of like pulling all these things that you're interested in together and that to your point exactly where it just, it creates that, that timeless look that, you know, is of an era, but people now can still appreciate it. Yeah, sure. And then you have like what I would call civilians, non-hardcore people, uh, you know, using, they're, they're wearing stuff that they don't even realize how influenced by punk or hardcore it has been. You know, you, they, I've seen bonds of friendship uh, used many different ways with nothing to do with instead. And I'm fine with that personally. I'm glad that somehow I was involved in something that, 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 made an impression on people as a, especially you know like if i look back and go i was 17 years old when i put that together like whoa um and you know so you know you got urban outfitters making a, a shirt that says united with the exact bonds of friendship kids on it, it just says united instead of instead you know um yep. other bands use it you know i i think terrors used it um i think there's been some euro bands that have done it i couldn't I couldn't begin to. Oh yeah, no, there, no, for sure. I mean, it's like half hard. I mean, all of the you know hardcore bands like just doing their you know inspiration slash rip off shirts. Like it's just always you know it's cool to see that because it's a nod to what came before, and then it still looks good. You know, right, right. And then and like I said, then you get into like some of the streetwear where they don't even have necessarily have anything to do with hardcore, but they recognize imagery, right? And they're they're just it's like you said the uc with the straight alert it, 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 it resonates whether you know what it is or not it's just it's yes yeah. something to behold you know yeah absolutely when did you first uh i guess notice that 
you know, instead started to build a following in regards. Cause I know like I, I started to get into, you know, punk and hardcore, like in the, the mid nineties and starting to go to shows at, you know, glass house and see strife all the time and that sort of stuff. So like, I did not, like I mentioned previously, see you guys. And it, it felt like that era of like, you know, you guys outspoken, all that stuff. Like, I mean, playing in front of a thousand people in like long beach, like that, just, that's a lot. <laughs> and so yeah. I guess, when did you, when did you start to notice like, Oh wow. Like there are so many people showing up for us. And it felt like it was a real, you know, thing, so to speak. I can tell you specifically the day that I realized that, um, the day that I realized that was after we had returned from our first U S tour, which was in, the fall, uh, the fall, winter of '88. Uh, we did two months. We were gone for Thanksgiving. We got back. I, I want to say a week or two after Thanksgiving, maybe two weeks after Thanksgiving. And uh, Ron from Final Conflict was booking a, a, a show. I forget what his his uh, his promoter name was back then, but it doesn't matter. There's there's a flyer that exists out there. It was at a VFW sure. in Garth Grove, and you know, we had been on tour and, you know, there were spots on the tour that were successful. There were times when we were playing to, you know, 12 people, but overall we had a good tour. Um, and we came back and, and that was our first show back. And I don't remember how long it was after we, we, we came home. I want to say it was in the spring. I think it was either, I'd, I'd have to look at the flyer to see the date, but it felt like in my mind, it feels like it was spring. And, uh, I believe it was, was on the bill. I know No For an Answer was. I know we were the headliner. No For an Answer. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter. But we pulled into the parking lot and it was packed. And we're like, what is everybody here for? Like, it was confusing to us. Right. Uh, you know? And and then, um, you know, then you realize like, uh, like people are lined up at our merch table. Like, whoa. Like what happened? Like it would seem like overnight, honestly. It was like, it was like the local guys go out on tour. Oh, they're a national act now, so maybe we should pay attention. I, I, it was bizarre, but that was the actual day where I was like, "Whoa, things have changed." And um, right, this feels different. Yeah, we played two songs, and and the the venue pulled the plug on us. And uh, there's video of it uh, on on YouTube of uh, I think anyways of uh of us playing live and let live like three quarters of the song without power just me playing drums and the crowd singing along and everybody's dancing and having a good time um but that was the day that i realized oh things are different now and then from there it just grew and grew and grew and grew and you know going back to to uh switching gears but going back to your i think it was your opening question not only with epitaph did we not follow the trend I guess you could say wishing well was somewhat predictable, but what wasn't predictable is we also, uh, uh, revelation records was a brand new label at that time. I think they had two, two, seven inches out and they wanted to do something with us. And it really came down to the fact that they wanted to do a seven inch wishing well, wanted to do a full length and, and then wishing well being in fountain Valley versus Connecticut for revelation at the time it was to us a no brainer, like, Oh, we'll do a full length and we'll do it with wishing well with our heroes uniform choice. You know, would that have changed the trajectory of instead? I don't know. Maybe because revelation became a big deal, you know, right. Uh, more so. And basically wishing well was fading at that time. You know, um, we didn't realize it because it started fading right after we signed, you know, so and then, and then, you know, Frank started Nemesis Records and he hit us up and Frank was really, really, do you know Big Frank Harrison? Yeah, I know. I, I never met him, but yes, I'm yeah, aware. He, yeah, he ran Zed Records and he was a bass player with Carrie Nation. Great guy, promoted shows, really just like, to me, one of the most important people in Southern California hardcore. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he was head of security for Golden Voice at the Fenders and uh, the Olympic and things like that, you know? So... So he came to us and said, Hey, I'm starting a label. Is there any chance you guys would do something? And we said, well, if you can get it out in a month, we'll do it. And he said, I can do it. <laughs> Good. And it's so amazing. Said, okay. 
we recorded and left on tour. And I think within a week of being on tour, the seven inch was mailed to us to sell on tour. And amazing. He, he, he put the whole cover and every, everything. He did everything. And we just said, go for it. Just we'll record. Here's the tapes, knock it out. And that was that, you know, and it, it ended up being, I think most people like Winstead seven inch, but better than either 12 inch, but right. <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like uh, those, those things of where you are just operating off of pure instinct, sometimes just res. Yeah, just resonate with people, you know, in, in different ways. And it's not like one is better than the other. It's just like a pure preference where you're like, I identify with this record because it just sounds like, you know, children playing in a room or whatever. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And, and, and to your point, too, like it was just, hey, this is Frank. We can help him out and he can help us out yet again because it seemed like he was doing nothing but helping us out. I mean, we just we hit it off with Frank right away. And, and so it seemed like the absolute right thing to do. There was no question in anybody's mind that Nemesis was going to put out our second hitch once he presented right. it. Right. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, and then, you know, then going back to the Epitaph thing, same thing. Like, hey, what do we do? Uh, this seems like the right thing to do. Like, let's let's do it. And Right. That's what Just, we're yeah, the logical progression. Yep. Um, so, something that I find interesting, too, about – you know, kind of the fact of what you were talking about in regards to, you know, straight edge literally being obviously like a marketing ploy, um, which sounds so strange because, you know, that can be so alienating to many people, especially as the right. the scene kind of progressed. Um, and, you know, I know they're obviously the, you know, famous slash infamous, you know, chain of strength practice space photo session for the seven inch. And, you know, I know that a lot of of that sort of atmosphere of being like, Oh, does this like, does this even feel anything of like why we got into it? You know, kind of was one of the many reasons why you guys, you know, stopped playing. Did you, did you feel like it was kind of creating a confusing environment for either like kids coming to shows and that sort of stuff? Or was it just something that you guys were like, this has become too, for lack of a better term, commodified? Yeah, I mean, I think all of that stuff is relative to what you're saying there. Um, I think some guys realized it before I did, say like Billy Rubin from Half Off or before even before he went Half Off. He recognized how silly it was becoming, right? And so he basically revolted, you know? And, and it was weird to us because the dude was our friend and he was a really good friend of ours and an early proponent of Instead. Him and Dan O'Mahony both were early on before Instead had played any any fender show and, and so they were like the first guys that weren't in our in our local local scene in anaheim you know these guys were from huntington beach they they're they're driving to see us practice and hanging out with us and we're driving out there and hanging out with them and uh so there were guys that definitely recognized it before i did like and I, billy rubin's always the one that stands out in front of me uh, the most to me um because I was kind of bummed out at the time. Like, man, what happened to my friend? Like, why does he hate what I'm doing? You know? And as you know, then I started to go, Oh yeah, he just saw it before I did. You know what I mean? He, he, he recognized where this was going and, and, and how, to your point, how alienating this can be for people. And that was the part I really hated was the alienation of like, uh, you know, the, 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 the hard edge, um, straight edge movement, uh, hardline, uh, vegan movement too. Like that started up, uh, I, I think right before our last tour. Um, and there was, we, I forget. I, I don't know. There was some conflict between us and some hardline, uh, bands, uh, back then because we were the complete stark opposite. And then I had a, I had a weird, um, I, I had a weird juxtaposition with, with instead this posse band. I like to fight. So sure. I, wasn't, I, I was like, I was a pretty negative guy who would fight anybody. I didn't care if I got beat up. I, I'll fight you. If I think we need to fight, we'll fight. So when I had these like hardline guys running their mouths, I was like, you know what? And there was, there was some issues in Cleveland too. 
uh, like I was always the guy to just say, oh, what's everybody's, everybody's bumping gums over here. Like, let's, let's stop talking, you know? Uh, right. Let's, so- let's solve this problem, whatever that may yeah, be. Yeah, whatever that is. It's completely juvenile and stupid, but that's where I, that's where I was at, like my headspace. Um, but I really did. I hated I hated how quickly people would dismiss us or associate us um, with just like vanilla youth crew. And don't get me wrong. I'm not, you know, I, I can totally look at it, you know, objectively and say, well, it's not like we were, you know, some technically ripping band. Like there's nothing earth shattering about instead. Instead was a live event. We were a good time. We, 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 we got along with everybody and we, our shows were just a good time in general, most of the time. Um, but I could see how people would just, you know, push us to the side, uh, for something a little bit more, um, diverse or unique or whatever you want to call it, you know? Um, but we, I definitely disliked how quickly we were put into a box. And I also, didn't like putting people into a box. You know, I spent a lot of time almost as like a straight edge apologist. Like, no man, I don't care if you drink. I don't, I don't care at all. You know, like just be a cool person and I'm good, you know? Uh, so yeah, I, I think that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then, you know, I mean, obviously after instead, you know, you've, you stayed involved, you clearly still care about, you know, hardcore playing in bands and, um, you know, staying connected And I mean, you don't need to, like, obviously (laughs) many, you know, quote unquote, you know, normal people, like they kind of, uh, you know, phase themselves out and just don't stay connected because it just doesn't resonate with them anymore. What, uh, what keeps you, I guess, connected and wanting to still, you know, create and either go to shows, hang out with friends. And is that just in your bones? Yeah, it is. I mean, um, you know, I like it's funny because I feel like America's like finally catching up to Europe in this in this uh, sense. Like it's not uncommon to see, you know, um, I don't want to say elderly, but you know, older, old, much older people, people my age, into hardcore in Europe. It's completely to them. It's no different than liking Aerosmith or freaking Britney Spears. Like, oh, this is the music I'm into, and that's what I'm into. Like in America, to me, and I, I'm painting with a broad stroke here, so please bear with me. Sure. Most, it seems like most people have like a five year window, you know, or or so, give or take, right? Like, oh, I was into this, but now yeah, that's all juvenile and stupid. I'm not into that anymore. I've graduated to this, that, and the other thing, you know. Um, but I'm starting to see now, like, especially like you know, people my age and maybe just a little bit younger, they're, they're, they're going to show still, you know, of course it isn't nearly the numbers that it was back, you know, in 89, 90. Uh, but it it is, they're, they're, they're still there. I mean, I just saw them at the, at the indecision show, you know, I see them anytime I go to a show, there's, there's people my age and sometimes older where before you very rarely saw that when I was a teenager going to shows, you very rarely saw anybody, over the age of 25. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and to that point too, I mean, now that the scene has splintered off into so many different things and it's obviously had more time to mature, you do have this ability to have this multi-generational audience as long as it, you know, is able to regenerate, which, you know, now it definitely has because, there are still so many people that care about it and are, you know, old humans like you and me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was a very communal experience and still is. And, uh, and, um, like, I, I I don't know. I mean, it sounds so corny, but I took it seriously and I, I still take it seriously. Like, I think that, you know, hardcore punk rock, the scene, uh, has a lot to offer. And I think it has a lot to offer kids who are otherwise alienated and outcast. And, um, you know, dare I say, might've saved my life, you know? Um, mm-hmm. and, and so, you know, like, again, when I, when I go to shows and I, 
you know, people want to talk to me about, you know, questions I've answered seemingly a million times. I don't mind. I'll give them the time of day and I will talk about it and I will try to, you know, uh, give any wisdom or, or, or trivia to them that I, that I can, you know, um, nostalgia, whatever you want to call it. Uh, because I think that to, to me, like, that's what it was all about, you know, just like, just a very communal thing where the, the, there's a very, very thin line between artists and fans, you know, Yep. I, I don't know how else to say that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And that's, I, I think that's why people hold it so dear because it is something that is pretty unique to this style of music. And even though we're looking at this through rose colored glasses, it, you know, there's much of it that still holds true, even though, you know, it's evolved over the past, you know, 20 to 30 years. Oh, sure. Yeah. It's a much different hardcore is a much different thing than it was back in 89, 90 when I was thriving in it, you know, but it, it doesn't make it any better or any worse. It's just different. And it, it has to evolve, right? Like it has to, to stay relevant. Yep, exactly. Like, yeah, it can't just rest on its laurels. It needs to, you know, morph and change and throw old stuff out and bring new stuff in in order for obviously the, you know, youth movement that this is meant to be to still continue and to to carry itself on. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, and then there's a handful of, of, of those people that go back and, and do their, their homework, you know, they, they, they go back historically and listen to, you know, bands from the late seventies, early eighties through the mid eighties and nineties and, and try and understand what influenced, you know, how they ended up where they're at, you know, um, which I think is really important. Um, plus there's just a lot of great music you'd be overlooking if you didn't. Steve Larson, everybody. Well, thank you for downloading this episode, listening to it, streaming it, whatever it is. But and thank you to Steve because uh, he didn't need to do this. And a big shout out. I know he'll never listen to this, but Dave Mandel from Indecision Records because he was the one who brought the idea to me. And I was like, you know what, Dave? That's a really good idea. I love that. Next week, I have a great episode because, I mean, let's be honest, they're all great, right? <laughs> but this is another discussion a person I have never spoken to before, but was such an engaging and electric chat. Liz D'Angelo from Filth is Eternal, who just released a record on Monarch Heavy. Uh, many, many people work over there that I love dearly. And this idea came across the table and I decided to have Liz on the show. She identify or they identify as they, them. I was going to say she, and I was like, no, I'm just completely butchering the pronouns and that's not cool. But um, yeah, Filth is Eternal, awesome band from the Pacific Northwest. Really, really interesting upbringing, story, pursuit of art, all of those things. So that's what we got next week. And until then, please be safe, everybody. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah. Oh. Sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hello, I'm Chelsea Peretti. Do you feel chronic existential dread but love talking about delicious snacks? Call me. My podcast is relaunching. Do you fear wild, dangerous animals to the point where you're constantly watching attack videos and reading articles about wild animal attack survivors or those who succumb to attack? Call in. We can also discuss reality shows and emergency room footage. Listen to Call Chelsea Peretti on Will Ferrell's Big Money Players Network on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. A family favorite for three decades. The Bull Run Festival of Lights dazzles with two and a half miles of sparkling holiday lights. See more than 600 light displays with new displays added every year. Ooh and ah as you drive through the winter wonderland where it's always snowing and come see the tallest light display yet. Extend the magic of the holidays by visiting early starting November 10th. Get your tickets now at bullrunfestivaloflights.com. That's bullrunfestivaloflights.com.